Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Stoll, and uh, I am a EM intensivist at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Uh, and I have the distinct uh, privilege of getting to welcome you all this morning to our annual Critical Care Lit Blitz. Uh, I'm accompanied today uh, by uh, two friends and great EM intensivists at the University of Michigan, Colin McCluskey and Carrie Harvey. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit today about papers you might have missed that are really hot in the critical care world right now, uh, maybe haven't really been discussed as much in the EM literature, things that may have happened, whether it be in critical care medicine, right on through to the Journal of Trauma, um, that maybe you read, maybe you don't, but really should probably have some influence on your practice. And the idea here is we've only got 20 minutes, so we're going to try to move. Um, we know that critical care is about nuance. Uh, we debate these sort of things constantly. We've spent actually all morning debating a lot of these, uh, and we're happy to take questions at the end uh, if you have uh, questions about some of the more nuanced pieces of things. To get started, we don't have any financial disclosures. We're all too relatively new to the world of critical care uh, to be involved with any of these studies and be funded yet. Uh, opinions are our own. Obviously, these aren't uh, necessarily reflect in the discussion of the actual papers themselves. But last, uh, we, we really want to emphasize Literature is such an important thing to be familiar with, and so feel free to read these papers yourself. And to facilitate that, uh, if you, at any time you see this logo, we'll have it uh, at the beginning and at the end as well. You can feel free to take a picture of it uh, with your phones, uh, and a drop it should take you directly to Dropbox, which has all the articles contained in it as well. So let's get started. I'm going to sort of first up and talk about the Retic study. Uh, Retic is a uh, really interesting study about one of my favorite topics out there, which is massive transfusion. There are few things, in my opinion, that are as much fun as just slamming blood into people when they need it, right? I mean, the trauma patient we have started to realize is interesting because they don't always need a surgeon. In fact, more and more traumatic injuries aren't going to the OR, are merely just getting watched in ICUs and we're reversing coagulopathy, addressing the bleeding that's happening. That's awesome because it means that we are already effective traumatologists and we can be even more effective. We don't even need the surgeon sometimes, um, but sometimes we do. Uh, um, the Retic study, however, uh, is looking specifically, it's a randomized control trial at a single center in Austria, looking at pretty sick, uh, traumatically injured patients. Most of these are blunt trauma because, as you know, penetrating trauma really does not happen much in Europe. Uh, and these are patients who had a demonstrated, quantitatively demonstrated coagulopathy uh, that we're looking at how to reverse that. And the two arms were FFP, which is pretty much our standard of care, versus fibrinogen concentrate. So I'll just take a second and ask you, how many of you have ever used fibrinogen concentrate? Exactly. Uh, so it's a question that actually is very interesting, but it's something that we're not using a ton of, but maybe we should be, is really the question that this uh, study is asking. The study was, of a, uh, was initially planned for about 250 people to answer the question of which one does a better job in reducing essentially transfusion requirements. Uh, and then there were a lot of secondary analyses planned, mortality, organ failure, things like that. Well, bad news, or well, good news for them, the, the trial was stopped early, so they uh, stopped it after only about 100 patients. Uh, because there were such significant amount of requirement for further transfusion ongoing for patients in the FFP group as opposed to the fibrinogen concentrate group. The fibrinogen concentrate is, if you think about it, really the scaffold on which a clot is formed, right? Factors have nothing to do with actual clot. They have everything to do with initiating clot. You need them in order for the clotting cascade to happen but they don't actually create the clot. Fibrinogen is that scaffold. And so the theory here is that you give them a concentrated vial of fibrinogen, essential, uh, of uh, you know, genetically created, sort of created fibrinogen. It's a single push over a couple of minutes, and they have the scaffold on which to create clot, and hopefully will stop, clot, or stop bleeding. That said, all of their really patient-centered outcomes were really not significant. As you can see, organ system failure, for example, didn't meet uh, any sort of significant p-value. Same thing with the hospital, uh, in-hospital mortality. So didn't have a lot to tell us other than 
people didn't need to be redosed with clotting factors. The key that I take home from this paper is all of these people were brought into the study with quantitatively uh, evaluated clotting factors, right? All of them had to have a tag or rotem, so uh, a thrombolastography, to see. How many of you are doing thrombolastography routinely in your patients? We need to get on board with this, is my sort of overall look from this study, is that maybe fibrinogen concentrate is something we're going to be pushing here in the next couple years when there's some sort of more rigorous studies done. Maybe keep an eye out for it. But at the end of the day, this is how we're practicing medicine. Goal-directed therapy is the answer to a lot of the things we do. And it has been shown over and over and over again that TEGS and ROTEMs are the way to reduce our transfusion requirements in patients. So when massively transfusing patient, really the only thing that we can say definitively about this RETIC trial this year is don't forget about the scaffolding. We forget about this a lot, right? Proper came out now a couple years ago. We've all probably routinely changed our massive transfusion to one to one to one. The problem with all of those ones are that scaffolding is not included in any of that, right? FFP is initiation, packed red blood cells are oxygen carrying capacity, and then platelets are the actual clot. But what happens when you don't have the stuff to make the clot in the beginning? Platelets don't matter. So we're probably forgetting that. Think about cryo, think about fibrinogen concentrate. It's really expensive in the United States right now, but if you really want to rev up your trauma surgeons, suggest it. I'm going to hand it over to Colin. Perfect. All right, I'm going to travel a little bit. So the, the next we're going to talk about is steroids and sepsis. Um, obviously a sexy topic that we could get into the nuances of. But for a bit of background, if you're not familiar with the literature, this has been looked at since the 60s, insofar as if you give steroids to septic patients, do they get better or worse? This really picked up in the early 2000s when an RCT, if you looked at the data, kind of skewed, showed a mortality benefit. However, in the decade that's since followed, multiple RCTs and meta-analysis have really developed two kind of hypotheses. One, steroids really don't help in mortality as far as they don't have mortality outcome. That's significant. What they do do is hasten shock reversal. But the question that Adrenal asked is one, let's put the mortality question to rest, but what are the patient-centered outcomes that are important, that if you give hydrocortisone to septic shock patients, do we get, and are they safe? Is it, are we hurting people? Right. So Adrenal was actually a multi-centered international RCT, 3,800 patients, mostly in Australia, but Wonderfully well done. That's how it made it to the New England Journal of Medicine. So methodologically very robust. Most of these folks were pretty sick. They were all mechanically ventilated. They were all on vasopressors. And, you know, their Apache score would say, uh, they should have about a 40% mortality. So a fairly sick cohort. We see these folks in the ED not uncommonly. So their primary outcome was 90-day mortality. So one... Um, I will show you is that there was no mortality difference. Both were around 27, 28%, which is totally consistent with the body of literature we've had since the early 2000s. What this uh, Kaplan-Meier curve does show is that steroids hasten shock resolution. And we show this you know, pretty, de um, um, pretty definitively. And that once again, that's consistent with the entire body of knowledge we have within this patient population. As far as the question of safety, adverse outcomes, um, there were more adverse outcomes in the steroid group. Most of these were not particularly significant to patients. You put someone on a hydrocortisone infusion, they're going to become hyperglycemic. That's not obviously the same as bacteremia, which there was no difference between groups, or myopathy, which is the other one classically that we worry about with steroids. And so far as there was only two cases of myopathy in the 1,800 folks in the steroid arm. So what is the takeaway from this particular well-done study? So um, if you're familiar with the FOMED world, uh, Josh Farkas is a poem critical care guy that does a lot of writing. And I like the paradigm that he's introduced. You're going to give steroids for sepsis with the same goals as you do in COPD for symptom resolution. Um, what we found is that in, uh, in the adrenal study, you save people a day of vasopressors. They come off a day early. This is important to me as an intensivist upstairs 
because if I can, if their pressors are coming down, I'm going to feel more emboldened to de-escalate other areas of their care, weaning them from mechanical ventilation, maybe diuresing them from the kind of initial resuscitative fluid boluses. This is going to actually have significant effects. When do I use steroids practically? When I'm adding a second vasopressor. The second I'm going to vaso or I'm thinking a different, something beyond norepi, I'm adding steroids because I think this is a patient-centered benefit that's going to affect downstream care in a meaningful way. All right. Staying on the sepsis bandwagon, uh, we talk about a, the SSSP2 trial, which doesn't have a sweet name like adrenal. No. But what this basically looked at is if we apply first world interventions in the third world for sepsis, what are our outcomes? So despite the fact that most of the research has come from the first world, we had obviously the triumvirate of studies, promise, process, and arise within the last couple of years that were well done, the actual burden of sepsis is the most in the developing world. So in Zambia, they applied a, you know, a single center RCT looking at a sepsis bundle, fluid resuscitation, vasopressors, blood transfusions, kind of akin to the early goal-directed therapy, versus just usual care for that system. Now, we'll note that the main takeaway is, is you have to be very cognizant of the patients and the system in which you apply any therapy, and I'll show you why. So their outcome was in-hospital mortality, in which 50% of the people in the sepsis bundle arm died, versus about a third, 33%, in the usual care. This is a little bit shocking, but if you actually look at the patients and look at the system, it makes sense. Zambian sepsis patients are in their mid-30s, are HIV positive, have CD4 counts in the 60s, and have either malaria or TB. That's probably not the population that you're taking care of at your institution. Also, all but one of these patients, there's about 200 in it, were treated on a medical ward, not in ICU, and not with, with mechanical ventilators available. All right? So if you got into difficulty with, say, over enthusiastic fluid resuscitation, you really couldn't salvage these folks. And as a result, they did worse. So what's the takeaway here? Why am I telling a bunch of people who practice in the first world in non-HIV positive patients about this particular trial? At the end of the day, there is no such thing as a free lunch in medicine. Every therapy we do carries legitimate consequences and benefits. And you have to think about both the patient in front of you and the system of care in which you work before you apply guideline-based or bundled-based interventions, all right? You apply a 30 milliliter per kilogram bolus to a malnourished Zambian, you're going to kill them. Similarly, you might get into similar trouble if you do that same strategy in someone with heart failure here in the States. With the new surviving sepsis guidelines of a one-hour bundle with this 30 milliliter per kilogram, if you misapply it to the wrong patient, you don't think of the risk benefit for that individual patient, nor you don't have the system, positive pressure ventilation, to bail you out, you're going to probably hurt people. So whenever you apply evidence-based medicine, think about the, both the patient and the system in which you work, so you make sure that the interventions you have are, in fact, effective and not deleterious. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. So, two more studies. Uh, we only have a few minutes, so I'm going to go as fast as I can here. So, the first one, um, this is the SMART trial, which is a companion study to SALT-ED, which I'm guessing many people in emergency medicine in this room have probably read that study, which I don't have time to go over. But um, SMART was done at the same institution, uh, Vanderbilt, in the emergency department. And what they looked at was whether or not um, uh, critically ill patients receiving either normal saline or a balanced solution, which was primarily lactated ringers, um, had better outcomes. The primary outcome was actually a composite of 30-day mortality, need for renal replacement therapy, or persistently abnormal renal function. So um, this was, again, another very large study of like 15,000 patients. Um, 
If you got at least 500 mLs of fluid in the emergency department and were admitted to the ICU, you could be included in this trial. The, uh, down here you can see on our plot, we have a, a trend, well not really a trend, they did find a, a statistically significant benefit to using balanced crystalloids in these critically ill patients. It was a 1% difference between the groups, but again amongst 15,000 people, that ended up being quite a large outcome. Um, interestingly, in the SMART trial, as compared to SALT-ED, the results were driven more by mortality than by the need for renal failure. So that suggests that the normal saline that the patients were getting could be affecting mortality in ways other than just acute kidney injury. Maybe it helps, or maybe it harms and modulates inflammation or hemodynamics, something that we don't quite understand yet. But again, this study is adding to a large body of evidence <laughs> that normal saline can cause harm. We know of lots of observational studies that show us that normal saline is acidic, it causes a non-GAP hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, and it can, uh, again, hurt us in terms of hemodynamics, inflammation, and renal injury. So my takeaway from this, um, normal saline is uh, what most people go to. It's what you grab in the bay. It's what the nurses automatically hang without asking. It's what you give without really thinking. But remember that fluids are a medication. Remember that there's never been a study that shows that normal saline is superior in any way. It's just always been assumed to be safe and okay to give. And now we have this growing body of evidence that tells us that a balanced solution such as lactated ringers would actually be a smarter choice in many critically ill patients. There are of course some caveats to that which we won't get into the physiologic basis of that today. But for me, LR is actually my fluid of choice for the vast majority of patients. Okay, the last study, um, detox AMI. Um, this is building on a prior study done a few years ago called the AVOID trial, where they looked at oxygen versus room air in non-hypoxic patients with STEMI. And that study found uh, no difference between the, uh, the groups in terms of the primary outcome of mortality, but they did find some differences with um, infarct size on follow-up cardiac MRI and changes in uh, like uh, the troponin level between the groups. This study is a little bit different. This looks at oxygen versus room air in non-hypoxic patients with suspected acute myocardial infarction, and it was suspected if you had six hours of chest pain or shortness of breath, and you had an EKG change consistent with ischemia or an elevated troponin. And this didn't look at infarct size or troponin levels, this looked at mortality. So a little bit more of a patient-centered outcome. Um, for this graph, you can see, so this is, um, our y-axis is mortality, days after randomization is up to a year. Um, you can see that the mortality in both groups is very, very low, so they had to make, make another graph to actually show what we're trying to see here. Um, the take home is that there was no difference in mortality between the groups. There were some secondary outcomes where there was a statistical significance. Um, it was like need for inotropes was one of them. Um, but kind of small changes between the groups. And the takeaway that I have for this one is that oxygen has always just been this, again, kind of thing we do when we suspect a myocardial infarction. We all know the MONA, uh, um, uh, thank you, acronym, I'm sorry, <laughs> forever. Um, and there's still guidelines that recommend that supplemental oxygen give, be given to people. And the rationale is that if we have ischemic or ischemic tissue, we want to get oxygen to that tissue. The caveat is that there's also been studies that show that supranormal levels of oxygen generate free radicals, and that can cause um, uh, increased infarct size for uh, myocardial infarction. So my take home is that if you are normal oxic, in, which in this study was defined as a SpO2 greater than 90%, Oxygen is not needed. It will not improve your outcome. And in fact, it may actually be harmful. And so if you have a patient come in, you're worried about them, they don't have to be put on supplemental oxygen. 
If you have a patient come in and you're worried about them and someone's already slapped oxygen on it, you can take it off and it's safe. All right. I don't know what happened with the formatting here, so I apologize. But if any of you guys are interested in getting the um, PDFs of the papers that we discussed, again, you can scan the QR code and it will take you to a Dropbox folder where you can get those. Um, all of our emails are listed and we're happy to answer any questions you have regarding um, any of the studies we talked about, critical care in general, or if anyone in the audience is interested in um, critical care fellowship, we've all been fellowship trained and we're happy to talk about that as well. Uh, that being said, we are pretty much on time. Are there any questions that we can answer? So we were debating um, before we came to give our talk about what's the next big study in critical care that we would all like to see. So I'm going to bat that over in our last minute here to you guys. What do you want to see come down the pipeline in the next year? Well, I mean, there, there are several studies that are, have finished recruiting and that we're waiting on results. One, if you were at the previous talk, is uh, the effect of VV ECMO on ARDS, which is big in the intensive care world, probably less so for the EM folks, but that should be presented within the next couple months. Um, the other is a sedation trial, uh, the SPICE trial, that's going to like a goal-directed sedation, which is really dexmedetomidine versus propofol and trying to uh, dial in appropriate Richmond agitation scores and what the effects are in long-term mortality. it has been a lot of work done that the decisions we make in the emergency department as far as both sedative choice and sedative depth have legitimate downstream effects and this is going to add far more literature um, kind of to that discussion. And I mean the reason why this is at SAAM, the reason why we're passionate talking about to the emergency doctor that's not upstairs, is what you do absolutely matters and alters the trajectory of these patients' care in the first hours. And so we're going to get more information on how you can, you know, affect positive change for the sickest patients you take care of. Uh, my answer would be I want to see if Paul Merrick is the genius that he says he is on NPR. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, uh, you know, I, I'm a little flippant, uh, or a lot, I suppose. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, if any of you have sort of looked at this recently, um, the popular press has said we found a cure for sepsis, and it's vitamin C, steroids, and thymine um, in, uh, in what was a totally non-evidence-based way in 48 patients. Uh, so those of us that are heavy academicians that rely on the evidence um, are really eager to see the multi-center trial that is actually ha having trouble getting started um, because some places have switched entirely to giving this to all of their sepsis patients um, without any meaningful evidence whatsoever. Uh, and so I'm really eager to see this one. Uh, I think it'll be probably 2020 that hopefully we'll be talking about that one, but I think it will be very interesting. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add mine is, um, it's a it's a subset of the pedal network, and it's called the Clover Study. Um, I'm not trying to plug my own institution, but Michigan is one of the centers that's doing this. It's a multi-center trial looking at um, uh, liberal fluid versus restrictive fluid before vasopressors and septic shock. Um, I absolutely fall into the camp of 30 cc's per kilo on every patient is really dumb, and it should not be in surviving sepsis, and it should not be a metric that you know gets your hospital paid if you click that box. To me. That one size fits all just doesn't make sense when you're looking at an individual patient. So um, I'm interested to see the results of that trial because uh, I, I fall into the camp of um, early pressors and less fluid to begin with. And so I'm hopeful that the study will corroborate what I'm doing to my patients currently. Um, all right, anything else before we wrap up? Any other questions? We'll go to the back if, if anyone wants to come up and chat about anything. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thanks.